Web 2.0, if I look back on it, was a lot more hype than execution simply because, one, it was a lot harder to use the, the development tools, Ajax and getting everything hooked up. Two, people never figured out how to monetize a hashtag. So Flickr and Delicious have gone kind of away. And then three, I just think, uh, you know, there's probably lots of other reasons that explain how come this bot thing is such a tidal force. And because I'm interested in it, and because everybody here is interested in it, I'm gonna let Mike talk about it. I'll just say a couple words about him. He works as the chief technical officer for this uh, North American design agency called Robots and Pencils. Uh, they have offices in Austin because he lives near Denver. They have an office in Do Denver with a bunch of other developers. And um, you guys hear me? I could okay. say more, wow. but that would cut into his talk. Um, yeah, so uh, pretty excited to be here. Definitely. Uh, you know, software technology history buff, never been to Zero Park, so that aspect of it is uh, is pretty exciting. Um, so we are walking around, just kind of geeking out a little bit. Uh, I think uh, I'm sure it becomes kind of old hat driving around here and stuff. But uh, for people like me, you know, it's like it's like a weird Disneyland. <laughs> so um, yeah, so uh, super happy to be here. Um, and so what I, I thought I'd do was kind of just walk you through my thought process, um, tell you a little bit, a bit about what I'm doing and like why I think, like why are bots a thing, why are we hearing about them, why now, why, um, you know, why not during the IRC days or the AOL days, et cetera. Um, what's different now? And so uh, my name is Mike Brevort. I founded uh, uh, this product, uh, and, and you know, in, in May we may spin it out, we may not, uh, but it's uh, called Beepboop, and it's a bot hosting platform that uh, is um, tailored toward developers uh, for Slack and Facebook Messenger currently. Um, and so, uh, just to give you a little bit of background on robots and pencils, uh, so we're about six, almost seven years old, uh, and we were we were founded on this this premise from this lecture from C.P. Snow in 1959 uh, called The Two Cultures and the Scientific Revolution where he postulated that like sort of the detriment of society at the time, and this is, you know, if you think about the time frame of the 50s and all the optimism in the 50s and the skepticism of the 60s and everything that happened, uh, you know, then the Vietnam War and everything, this like transition in the 50s and 60s. Um, that the detriment of society was the separation of two cultures, the arts and the, and the sciences, and that, um, you know, basically postulated that, that those, and it, it manifests themselves, like, in, in multiple ways, even in, like, right and left political movements uh, and other areas, and that, like, the problem in our culture is the separation of the, and the, the lack of respect between the two disciplines, and those things go hand in hand. So from a company perspective, we were founded on this notion that um, the arts and the sciences should coexist together uh, sort of from the beginning and forever. And so robots are engineers and pencils are artists and everything that we do we try to approach with both an uh, engineering perspective and an art perspective. And so uh, Beep Boop, uh, just to give you a little bit of background again, it's just a really simple hosting platform. It's uh, tailored toward developers. So uh, what we do is uh, we integrate with GitHub and we do continuous integration, continuous deployment, uh, auto scaling, and we manage uh, like uh, OAuth tokens for Slack and that sort of thing, and try to really grease the skids and make it as simple as possible for any developer to be able to build on top of the Slack platform and now the Messenger platform. Um, it's different uh, in that it, it is very developer-centric and developer-focused uh, versus some of the other uh, products that you're seeing being launched in the marketplace, which are very like business or end-user designer-centric. Um, and you know, we launched Bonds as containers, uh, Docker containers, uh, and that's pretty much all I'll say about Beep Boop uh, for this point. Um, but uh, what this means is that from a developer perspective, you can bring whatever language you'd like, uh, whatever framework you'd like, uh, we run it as a container. So uh, we're not sure exactly uh, you know, which, which of these frameworks, which languages are gonna sort of win and be more tailored to building bots, and so we'd like to give developers as much freedom as possible. Um, and so now, uh, just to talk about like, why bots, why now? 
And you know, there's so many people, uh, and I've been involved in a bunch of events around bots. Like I was just at one uh, downtown uh, today called Botanist, which is about 100 people. And uh, it's interesting, there's like mixes of people that have had history with sort of conversational interfaces and bots. There was um, the guy that created Smarter Child, which is a bot that launched on uh, AOL that was eventually bought by Microsoft. There are people that have written books in the 90s, people, you know, everybody's got these stories and a lot of people start with, I've been doing this a long time, um, and which is really interesting to hear and hear their backgrounds and, and there's some skepticism, but you know, you can't ignore, right, that all this, this momentum and at least noise and at least hype, <laughs> like that's happening in the news and I guess it's up to us to decide uh, what we make of that or if it actually goes anywhere or if it's actual a real thing. And so I think one of the, like, the key things is, uh, that's really driving this whole movement is this general rise of messaging. Uh, and if, you, you know, if you've seen any of the statistics on like, the most used apps uh, downloaded on mobile phones, uh, predominantly all messaging based. And as it turns out, Facebook owns the majority of those. Uh, and so if it's you know, between Facebook and Messenger, and even WeChat, and, and for different de demographics, even like Kick for teenagers and Telegram more internationally, uh, all very uh, messaging oriented. Uh, as well as, you know, if you look at, um, you know, we were just talking about like uh, our kids, and our kids, uh, like my kids are from like 11 to uh, 5, and so they've basically grown up, and all they've really known is touch interfaces, like those exist. I've had to force introduce them to like use a keyboard, uh, but it's very awkward. So they haven't known any different. Uh, but from an internet perspective, um, there are, are literally billions of people who know nothing about the internet except accessing it from their phone. And, and since that, I mean, if you look at you know, China, um, the messaging is so dominant there, I think, because that was the introduction. Like we have these, these like conceptions in our mind with how we interact with computers uh, being, you know, uh, tied to all this history and evolution from, you know, screen and keyboard entry. Uh, and you see, you'll see that even like with a mobile phone originally, like it's a very sort of hardware keyboard driven. And I think um, it's really interesting to think about, well, you know, if you, if you haven't had all this experience with computers before, before the phone and before you know, the, the most used app or messaging, uh, you probably think of things a little bit differently than you'd say. Um, and so, in addition to that, I think it's this general like, increased availability uh, and, and capabilities from a natural language processing, general like natural language understanding, and just sort of a machine learning and like deep learning renaissance that's really happening. Um, now, we'll say that some of those are totally way overblown. Like, what people are expecting that we can actually do, we can't do today. Uh, but I think one of the, the key differences is like we actually believe, or at least the industry believes that they can do it. You know, it's like this difference of, uh, you know, we've always talked about building flying cars. There'll be a day where people believe we could actually do it. And I think like, that's an inflection point. I think we're at this inflection point with like NLU and machine learning and uh, AI in general, where people are actually believing that we can do it, and, and, and naively so in some cases. And, and, it, and I think it's going to look a lot different maybe than uh, what it does today, but I think that's like one of the differences we actually believe that we can do it. Um, we'll see how well that turns out. Uh, and in addition, I think what we're seeing is AI and sort of conversational-based interface. Uh, I think it's really you know, driven around AI has the potential to have the same like step level change increase that mobile had and brought to our industry and all the solutions that that really, that that drove. I think like everybody sees that promise and you see, you know, there's momentum about bots, but I think, you know, there's bots, there's AI in general, and then there's sort of VR is like a lot of sort of the hype driven, uh, that's being driven in the industry right now. And I think, you know, AI kind of will underpin uh, all things. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people are predicting that Everybody that writes apps a year from now, there won't be any app that's ever created that doesn't include any, any AI. Maybe that's true, and maybe it'll be true because you build on top of these building blocks that include AI. I don't know. But it's becoming a lot more approachable. You're starting to see like, even just simple like NLU services as a service, like with AI and API to AI and the IBM Watson services, just doing basic like, uh, 
intent matching and end the extraction, like those is available to developers just over as an H as the HTTP JSON API uh, is is really empowering and driving a lot of this. Um, I think in addition to that, I think we're at this like this additional wave. There's like there's a wave happening. You can kind of feel a swell and all this momentum that's I think is leading to like the fourth generation platform. Um, and and when I say fourth generation, I look at that as like the desktop PC is the first generation. Uh, and you know the distribution model there was that you know apps were distributed on disks and, um, and installed locally on this machine that was very disconnected in an island of itself. Uh, and then came um, the web as kind of the second uh, big wave that really solved the distribution problem and you had these devices that were now starting to be connected uh, in offices and on the internet. And, uh, and it was interesting too because you went from this like sort of fat client to like thin client. Uh, and then came mobile which was like a whole other right, generational uh, change, which now you had these sort of kind of thick clients again, uh, with these native apps that were in your pocket. And it was amazing, right? That, uh, totally amazing, uh, the impact that that had. Um, and, then, um, and then now, I think, there's uh, what some people have called meta platforms. I kind of, I like that, I don't know, I don't really like that term so much. But, is that uh, you know today or even like two years ago, developers, you have to make this decision about okay, I'm going to launch an app, some application to consumers or end users, and I have to make these decisions about am I going to build a web app, am I going to build uh, you know a web desktop app, uh, a web mobile app, an iOS app, an Android app, am I going to use uh, PhoneGap or uh, one of those types of technologies that you know sort of write once, run anywhere type promise. Uh, and I think what these, some of these platforms have done, like let's say Slack, for example. Like my family uh, uses Slack as, just as like one of the free instances of Slack. And the reason we did was because I had an iPhone, my wife had an iPhone, I have a computer, and like one of my sons is on like a Windows computer most times, and another one's on a Mac. I mean, another kid, there's like an Android tablet floating around and stuff, and it was like, you, you had this client that you could install on all these devices that just brings everybody together. So like, if we go out on a date or out somewhere and they need to get a hold of us, they actually do it via Slack because it's the one place, like you can't send me a message on iMessage, and they don't have phones yet. And so it turns out to be like the one common place. It's really interesting. And so similarly, if you build on top of, um, you know, these platforms, like their clients already exist on every device. Like anywhere it makes sense for Slack to be, it already is. Facebook, anywhere it makes sense, it already is. In some cases, uh, even on you know, TVs and sort of non-normal devices for some of these platforms. Uh, so you know, iOS, Android, web, and even uh, like mobile web versions, et cetera. And so you have this reach, you don't have to, if you build on top of those platforms, you don't have to make those decisions and limit. And then so you also have these huge, massive, like the total addressable market of Facebook is the world, right? Like they measure things in like percentages of the world, man. It's unfathomable. Like what other product, you know, have you thought of like, you never really talk and, and, and define markets that way. And like when they talk, they, like I was talking to uh, one of the product managers today, um, a messenger in, in uh, one of these group settings, and it's just unfathomable to even think about the scale that they deal and they're like, we've literally billions of people. Like, and you know, we've got like, they have to continually close themselves off and isolate themselves because they just can't handle like even the support requests and when people have problems. And even if you just look at like the pure number of developers, like, the number of developers they have is as big as a large body of users that you would say like we have a lot of users on our product. And so anyway, you get like this reach from a device and reach perspective globally. You get just like the market that you can address on these platforms is huge and growing in and of itself, available sort of any time. And so I look at these runtimes as kind of like the meta platform is, and I look at bots honestly as this sort of first iteration of, uh, of like app development platform on top of these meta platforms. So like Slack, for example, you could build uh, a bot. They have like a, a bot user uh, uh, who like connects over a socket to their real-time messaging API. Um, they have uh, like these slash command things and, 
incoming and outgoing webhooks, and different ways to integrate with the platform. Um, and bots are a major piece of that. I feel like even for Facebook, uh, building that into Messenger, that it's the first sort of application runtime. I mean, Facebook had Facebook apps long ago that were those Canvas apps and iframes, uh, but that didn't, you know, it, it just didn't play well on mobile. It was like one of the key problems, and Facebook made the switch to mobile that really didn't play well. Iframes uh, went inside of web views. However, messaging is much lower fidelity, which lends itself to being able to render and be. Uh, you know, used consistently across all these platforms. And so I, I love this perspective because it's so true. Like when you think about all these shifts that happen, even the Web 2.0 shift that happened, and even what everybody said it was about was kind of wasn't what it turned out to be about. Uh, but it's that, you know, we over, always overestimate these platform shifts in the short term, but way underestimate them in the long term. Like, for example, we talked about like when the iPhone launched, uh, and when you got your iPhone the first time, whether you were one of those people that got the first version or whatever, I remember when I got, I wasn't one of like the early, early adopters, but pretty early, and I remember the first thing I did was I took it out, I like got it at a mall, an Apple store, hopped in my car, opened up the, the maps, the Google Maps app, and drove and saw the dot move and was like, this is amazing, like this. This device, this whole new way to interact that's like connected, uh, and it was amazing. But what I didn't think was, you know, in a couple years from now, I'm going to be able to stand on the sidewalk, open this thing, and just touch it and request a car, and the driver is going to have the same device with them. And magically, he's going to come and meet me on the curb, pick me up. A lot of times without any words exchanged, like, right, drop me off and I'm going to be charged just sort of transparently like like I didn't when, when I had that you know I had the iPhone like I didn't, you couldn't even really see that right so like we way sort of underestimate the impact that like that device is having to industries uh, and I think potentially conversational user interfaces and, and bots they at least have that potential whether or not it manifests itself like that or not I'm not sure and so um, I actually uh, I have a video and it's a video of Steve Jobs, uh, when he launched uh, the iPhone, uh, and it's about three minutes long, uh, but it, it, it really uh, kind of nails, I feel like, a similar, uh, like the similar feel of like the, the, the state at which we are now is very similar to the state at which he launched the iPhone into, and so I'll just go ahead and play that. You, so if you kind of make a, you know, business school 101 graph with a smart axis and the easy to use axis, Phones, regular cell phones are kind of right there. They're not so smart, and they're you know not so easy to use. Um, but smartphones are definitely a little smarter, but they actually are harder to use. They're really complicated. Just for the basic stuff, people have a hard time figuring out how to use them. Well, we don't want to do either one of these things. What we want to do is make a leapfrog product that is way smarter than any mobile device has ever been and super easy to use. This is what iPhone is, OK? So we're going to reinvent the phone. Now we're going to start with a revolutionary user interface. It is the result of years of research and development. And of course, it's an interplay of hardware and software. Now, why do we need a revolutionary user interface? I mean, here's four smartphones, right? Motorola Q, the Blackberry, Palm Treo, Nokia E62, the usual suspects. And what's wrong with their user interfaces? Well, the problem with them is really sort of in the bottom 40 there. It's, it's this stuff right here. They all have these keyboards that are there whether you need them or not to be there. And they all have these control buttons that are fixed in plastic and are the same for every application. Well, every application wants a slightly different user interface, a slightly optimized set of buttons just for it. And what happens if you think of a great idea six months from now? You can't run around and add a button to these things. They're already shipped. So what do you do? It doesn't work because the buttons and the controls can't change. They can't change for each application, and they can't change down the road if you think of another great idea you want to add to this product. 
Well, how do you solve this? Hmm. It turns out we have solved it. We solved it in computers 20 years ago. We solved it with a bitmap screen that could display anything we want, put any user interface up, and a pointing device. We solved it with the mouse, right? We solved this problem. So how are we going to take this to a mobile device? Well, what we're going to do is get rid of all these buttons and just make a giant screen. A giant screen. Now, how are we going to communicate this? We don't want to carry around a mouse, right? So what are we going to do? Oh, a stylus, right? We're going to use a stylus. No. <laughs> no. Who wants a stylus? You have to get them and put them away, and you lose them. Yuck. Nobody wants a stylus. So let's not use a stylus. We're going to use the best pointing device in the world. We're going to use a pointing device that we're all born with. We're born with 10 of them. We're going to use our fingers. We're going to touch this with our fingers. And we have invented a new technology called multi-touch, which is phenomenal. It works like magic. Right? I mean, I, yeah, I watched like 40 minutes of this last night. I, I ended up adding this. Uh, and um, it just, you to take it right back to that time where like mobile phones and the mobile internet was a mess. Like I remember I had one of those like Siemens Windows phones where like, you know, where the palm ones where you had to like, you sync, it's like you could sync your news in the morning or whatever, you know, those use cases. I mean, this was revolutionary, right? And, and, but nobody could think, like, I feel like we're in a similar situation now where we look at bots and what people are doing with them, and you're like, they're just toys, and it's not right, and it, there's no way, there's no way, there's no way. Um, and, and we'll see, maybe one of these inflection moments won't actually happen, right? Maybe this won't actually occur, but maybe it will. It'd be amazing if it did. Uh, and, but I think it, it'll take something revolutionary like this that just comes out of left field, and, and it, and seems obvious after the fact. Um, and so, you know, so like, where do you where do you start thinking about this? Um, I think uh, you know, number one, and, and some of these are like totally obvious. If you build products or like you try to solve problems, it's like find a problem. And I think one of the, the, the issues people have is, um, especially so I've been involved in like the this Bach community, and there's this frenzy, and everybody's like. Um, you always hear like the sales advice where people are like, don't sell the solution, sell the problem, right? And if you sell the problem, and then you say, well, I have the solution, and it, it becomes a very effective way to, to sell a product. But a lot of people are, you're so focused on bot. Like, I want to build a bot. They're like, what do you want to build? I don't know. Or I want to, I want to, and, and they're not like actually focused on that problem. And so, and then even when they say, I want to build a bot, and then I have this, I want to solve this problem, they say, I want to solve this problem with a bot, and it leads them down a very, narrow tunnel dead end of they, they set out to build a bot. And I don't necessarily think that bots are going to be products. Like nobody's going to go to the bot store, right? Like, like they're going to go to the app store. Like I, you know, if I have a need, a lot of times um, I get my phone out and I look at for an application. And like the phone is this, you know, it's this mobile device that's always with me. And the bot's not, I mean, the bot may be with me on an app, but I feel like the, uh, you know, I really think that bots will be part of the solution, but not the entire solution. Like, bots aren't the product. Now, the Amazon Echo is a product, and like Siri and the phone's kind of a product. We I mean, have things that interact with that, but like, so the thing I think people need to do is like actually find a real problem. And if, if you look at bots as one of the tools to be able to address that problem, then that's great. And then in addition to that, like, I've been with people that say, it's like, oh, if you're a startup, you, why, you, you should never create, don't, who creates an app these days, right? Like, that's garbage, create a bot. Yeah, you know, everybody should be creating bots instead of apps. Like, apps are so yesterday, and you're like, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. Um, and so, like, that bot experience that you build, that conversational experience has to be better than the app. It has to, like, be so much better. That, and, you, and to even know, like, why would I even, um, you wouldn't even think, you'd be like, oh, it's so much better than me. I mean, you think about all the, like, the way apps displaced a lot of things that you did and even saved you a lot of time, even like the, the, the taxi scenario where, and even if you think of things from like an HCI perspective, like what are those things that really reduce the, um, the friction between users? Um, and then so bots are obviously conversational and, and uh, you know, and a lot of people refer to bots as chat bots. Um, and so, uh, but like bots can also be, 
agents as well. Um, and uh, when, we, when we talk about conversation and bots, I feel like you know, meaning is, is much more important than protocol. Like protocol is uh, like RTFM, right? It's, uh, and and it's, it's one of those reasons like even with uh, Slack, so Slack launched uh, Slash commands as part of, who uses Slack? Okay, so you're all familiar with Slash commands? A lot of people are, and that's part of the problem with Slack launch. The Slash commands don't even know they exist. Like, so if you type Slash, you'll see an auto-completion of, of things you could do, and it gives you some indication of what you can type, but it's very similar to like a command line. There's some action, and then you pass in some data. Uh, and it's very like, it, it fits with a lot of developers, but it is very much like syntactical in that way. Um, and I think uh, conversational user interfaces, especially with bots, um, you know, we do things, we really need to extract meaning out of things. And that's where there's like general availability of like natural language understanding type tools to do basic, again, like entity extraction, intent matching is really important. Um, and so when I think about that, like when we think of these use cases of when do I want to control or communicate with a system via language, um, what it's really doing, and I think, what I think what the iPhone did was it significantly reduced sort of the, the impedance mismatch between the human and the computer, right? You actually had this device that was with you all the time. You didn't have to go home. Like when they talk about the, um, um, when they talked about the smarter child bot today, their biggest usage spike was at 3 p.m. on each of the time zones, like 3 p.m. Eastern time and then 3 p.m. Pacific time. And it was because students got home, kids got home, they dialed up, right? Like, right, they dialed up and they connected and they started to interact with the bot. Now you've got these devices that are with you all the time that you can actually touch and pinch and zoom and it feels completely intuitive and you, you kind of even forget that it didn't even exist before. Um, but it's similar to like, I think the ATM use case. I mean, you actually walk up to one of these devices for the first time, you don't even really, like, does that look like a thing that gives you money? If you didn't know, right, or if it didn't even, I know I grew up on the East Coast and they were called Mac machines. They were like money access centers. And I was like, what's an ATM? And, and so you go up to one of these devices and you immediately, you see options and you go and touch the screen, right? Or you would, if you didn't know any better, you would. And then you're like, that's not working. And then you're like, oh, there's these buttons on the sides. What? And they're not lined up even yeah. with the interface. And sometimes there's like buttons and there's like, you know, there's like a line to where it might be, but it's even not even centered there. And then, you know, and so even the whole thing and you're like, oh, I'm done here. Oh, but there's a keypad. Like, there's a keypad down here. Like, and you're like, oh, now my attention has to go down there and up. And it's, and it's like, you think of the, like, just the, the friction, the sort of impedance mismatch between, um, between the, the user and the computer versus, uh, and this may or may not be a good conversational use case where you'd walk up to the computer and say, I would like to take $40 out of my checking account. And if you can get past how it identifies you, it'd be way more efficient. Um, the other thing is, I feel like the industry is so focused on the conversation right now. Everybody, and, and I guess rightly so, is that's a big piece of the problem to solve. But it's just like, it's like the first step is part of it, right? And that what your bot does is like way more important than the conversation. You know, and like if you look at how you might actually build something like this, where you have some channel where you get messages, unstructured input coming into, that you apply some general natural language understanding to create some structure, and, and intuit meaning, then you do something really interesting with that, right? And then you send a message back, right? And, and you might enrich that message, you may do translations, who knows what, back to the channel. But that something interesting has to be really interesting and compelling. And if it's not, what the hell are you doing anyway? Like you've got a lot of these toy bots that are like chit chat bots and like, they're interesting uh, experiments and maybe for how, um, Certainly, you know, really interesting behavioral experiments, but so many people today are forgetting about the interesting part. They're so focused on the bot part and the conversation part. So. Um, and so I, I know for me personally, I, the thing that makes me most excited about um, bots when I thought of them originally was like bots as agents and even bots as conversational agents. But I, I thought some people separate those two things. They separate like chat bots as conversational things and agents as something different. I think. Um, those lines are being blurred. And so I think everybody's focused so much on the conversation. I think like the best conversation is the one you don't have to have. Like I want less conversation in my life. 
right? Like, I, there's so many people I talk to all the time. <laughs> I want less of that. If I, I want less demands on my time, I'd love to be able to do something with Siri or even I think one of the killer use cases I really think is travel, like booking travel. Anytime you get a book travel, it's really like hard. It takes a lot of time. And there's a lot of like cognitive load where you're like, you search and you get these options and they're like, all right, which are direct flights? in which, you know, you look at the times and you've got a scan and you maybe you do some filtering and then you're like, wow, but that's really expensive. And then, uh, and you get like decision fatigue and then like you pick, then like you pick a flight and you gotta pick up, all right, stay now. And then like you spend forever, like especially like w WDC this week, you know, and you're like, oh, where do I stay? And, and it just, it takes, you end up really burn like 25 minutes sometimes booking travel. And like, wouldn't it be awesome if, you know, you had this system that knew a lot about you where you can just say, whether you type it or whoever, but just, I need to go to, or it looks at my calendar, maybe it figures it out. But if you could just say, like if I could walk by, uh, you know, Alexa and be like, Alexa, I need to travel to San Francisco from Monday to Wednesday next week. So I leave in the morning at 8 a.m. and come back in the evening or whatever. And it generally knows, you know, it knows what airlines usually fly on, it knows my rewards, it knows like where I even have stayed in the past and maybe I can give it signals along the way where I'm like, oh, that one didn't work out or I like to stay at this one. And like, if it could find a really good match and the price is sort of where I usually like to, to be and above a certain thresholds, and I'm willing to sit down and answer a 20 question questionnaire about my preferences, if I could just do that every time, be like, book me a flight. And it just does it and shows up on my calendar and it's done, that would be amazing. Um, I think there are other similar use cases like that that are out there to be had. Um, but in that case, I'm not conversing every step of the way with the system making decisions. Like it's doing a lot of that for me. Um, and so, uh, and this is kind of a, I think really that, that we're gonna see the best, similar to mobile, uh, the, best, the best apps that were created were created. And I, I don't mean just like by developers exclusively, I mean with developers. And I mean, so this slide I, I gave at uh, OSCON and a couple other places where uh, you've got a lot of people that are building these like really full stack uh, bot builder suites where it's very focused on like uh, these scripts and conversation and it's like integration is like an afterthought. Like the thing that you actually do is an afterthought and they're so focused on, hey look, here's how you could order a pizza. You know, and here's how you can pick options and slot fill toppings and all that sort of things. And you're like, I'm sure you'd call some service. And I think like the, the people that are gonna really do the interesting, totally out of the box things, like all those systems are creating these boxes so early on, which is one of the reasons like we decided to build Beep Boop and focus on developers and have them launch as containers is because it's like so open-ended, we hope. And then once you start to build these tools, you're then constrained by these tools and constrained in thinking. And I don't want to constrain people's thinking because I think what we have now, if, that's, if what we have now is what it's going to be and all it's going to be, it's going to be a bust. Right? And so I think, I feel very strongly that developers will be involved uh, in, in what we create. And I think ultimately, as we think of like bots and this whole new opportunity for these new interfaces, if, if you're not making humans better, then it's not worth it. Right? And I think bots actually do have this opportunity to really make humans better, especially if you think of those autonomous agent sort of use cases of things that really could actually save you time. Um, and you start to think of, there's so much like, even your taxes and stuff like that, like where you, know, you don't have to like give your accountant or even you have this accountant that you're feeding all this information and it's very complex. But in general, that could be a very automated thing, even as complex as it is, even if that's a TurboTax bot that does it. And you, you know, that, like, there's a lot of these things that, that people do in these services that they do for you that I think uh, could, and even could just be augmented uh, by these bots and maybe be reviewed by humans. But ultimately, I think we've got to look at these fine problems and opportunities to make humans better, more efficient in society. Uh, and the other key thing with bots is context. I think we saw this with mobile, that you had this like additional context of you had you know, this device that was with you that had you know, a gyroscope in it and uh, you know, GPS knew where you were and it knew, it, it sort of, it was tied to you, right? It wasn't a computer that was shared. Uh, it, was, it was at your hip and it was yours. And I think in messaging, um, we had this ability potentially to reduce complexity of that significantly because the platform that you on knows a lot about you already. Even uh, like, you know, WeChat payments is, is huge. Uh, 
And so you could actually pay someone some money in China, like without having to put payment information, enter a credit card, et cetera, and your identity is taken care of there and as well. And I think as people create bots, if you don't pay attention to the context, it's going to be this failure. If, the bot, if you have to tell the bot who you are every time, um, that's, you know, it's a failure. It's, and it really, you know, people really, you, we can see examples of where they reject that. And there's this huge opportunity, like, don't ask for the same thing twice. And you have this kind of intimate, especially there's there's one-on-one -on -one bots and there's like bots in a group context, but especially the ones that know you and are your agent, like once you tell them and then they continue to learn, that's where I think, um, you know, companies that have a lot of data and a lot of data about you, obviously like Apple and Google have a huge advantage here, but if they can pull this off, it's really interesting. But I think in general, you know, paying attention to these things um, is, is gonna be huge. And it's a, uh, it's a really big opportunity for bots because you know that conversation bit is like this landscape that's um, you know it's just being text-based where you don't have to have structured and fixed menus. It gives you a lot of freedom uh, from a user interface, but a lot you know, and the constraints really breed I think freedom. Um, in addition to that, I mean this is something like uh, some people are going after this sort of it's like the Java write once run anywhere or even the um, the sort of web app containers and mobile apps of like write once run anywhere. Um, that I think the omni-channel approach, as some people call it, which is basically you have all these messaging platforms. You have um, you know, Slack and iMessage and Kick and Telegram and Skype and SMS and um, all, these, all these channels. And uh, people are creating these services to be able to target all those channels uniformly, which is really a least common denominator approach. Right, and and you could, you know, and people like they have punch throughs where you could like take advantage, and that, that's kind of the right thing to do. But ultimately, I think too is you make the mistake once you do that of putting everybody into the same box, right? And like the bot that you create, or the conversational interface that you create for Slack in a work context, is going to be completely different than the one that you launch for Facebook Messenger, unless you know, unless it's a consumer-based interface that you make available on Slack, but it's kind of awkward in Slack as well. Like I think you're trying to solve different problems. Even the ones that are targeted for something like Kick, which is adopted more for like teenagers, I think is gonna be even different than the one that you do for Facebook. It's like totally different demographic, different capabilities in the platform, even basic things of how you use imagery and buttons and carousels and what's available to you. Um, so I think multi-channel is really important. And then um, in addition, you know, your bot has to be intelligent, right? And that's what everybody expects is that like your bot should be really smart. Um, and that's interesting. It's a, like, and people are expecting that, that to be true. And um, I love this quote by Long, uh, Jan uh, Lacoon. And he said this in response to AlphaGo, uh, you know, when it beat uh, the human. And um, which was basically, if like intelligence was a cake um, and uh, unsupervised learning was like the cake part of the cake and supervised learning was the icing and reinforced learning was the cherry, we can't even make the cake. Like we can make icing and a cherry, but it's not a cake. We're trying to make a cake. Um, and that, you know, it's just this reminder of how far away we actually are of these things. Um, and then even Andrew Ning said something very similar. It's like, you know, uh, just about, uh, you know, deep learning and being really successful in very narrow domains, right? Uh, and not really good in very broad ones. And that, you know, here's one example of something we can't do, kind of off the cuff. We can't, we can't have a meeting conversation with a computer. Uh, yeah, and I, I mean, I, I think some aspect of that will come, but it's going to come a lot slower than we think. Um, and so when you see everybody, everybody these days who launches a chatbot always says it's an AI chatbot because that's what you do. And that's the moniker that you give it. Um, but really, like your AI chatbot that you think is a spaceship is really a, like, cart with bicycle wheels that's been sitting in someone's yard for like three years uh, getting like, you know, faded by the sun. Like really, and, it, like, and it's like the emperor has no clothes. You know, it doesn't take long for people to figure this out if you're trying to pretend that that's what it actually is. Look at Siri, like how frustrating is it to use Siri? And you, it was like, it's like this relationship of this girl, you just wish it could be so much more, but it's not, you know? And you think maybe tomorrow it will be, but it's like the same person, you know? And it's been years now, so. Um, and so, I don't know, maybe, maybe we're doing it wrong. Like maybe we should stop trying to create uh, intelligence from the top down. So sort of join me for like a thought experiment here. Um, so we take a really like a common use case, you know, it's whether the pizza bot or like the weather bot. And let's say we have this bot, Tempe, all it does is return the temperature. 
And so you have a human here that can ask for, uh, you know, what's the temperature uh, at a particular time in a particular place? And so you identify the intent as someone's asking for the temperature. And if I can extract the place and the time, um, then I could return a, an appropriate response, which is basically 67 degrees Fahrenheit and maybe some pleasantry with it. Because you're talking to like, you're assuming you're talking to a real person. Um, but then, you know, if, if that could happen, and if you have this bot on that side that can understand language in a rudimentary way and respond in language, then, you know, why shouldn't you be able to have a bot on the other side of that produce, even be able to produce a more structured version of language that's more easily interpreted and consistent. Uh, and then the other bot responds the same way, and you basically parse out, you know, an entity of like the temperature from it, right? So you can have just as well as like you have these really simple use cases, um, like almost mon monadic behaviors in tying like one bot to talk to another. Um, and so I think this is really interesting. Uh, and in thinking of bots as holons, which was coined by uh, Kessler in The Ghost in the Machine, that you know, a holon is this word he made up uh, from two Greek words, but it basically means both uh, something that's simultaneously a whole and a part. Uh, and it's, it's autonomous, it's self-reliant, it's sort of self-governed, it handles contingencies on its own, it's not governed by any like central authority, but it participates as a part of another system. Um, and that's what he called holons, is like sort of the ghost in the machine. And so if we think now of like a different, you know, and, and if you're like, oh great, I'm gonna go look up, I have an app from the weather, it actually works really well. I'm gonna really go into to some messenger and ask like type on my keyboard, what is weather in, and why do I have to even say where it is gonna be at whatever time, you know? And it's kind of a useless example, but something like this, if you think of like these bots, these autonomous agents, it'd be awesome if you could just tell the bot, hey, let me know uh, when I need to dress for the weather. So like, let me know like, if the weather's gonna be bad, or just tell me when that's gonna happen. Um, and that doesn't just mean when the weather's gonna be bad, but it's like, let me know when I should dress for the weather, which means maybe you know something more about me. Like, maybe sometimes later, the bot chimes back in, like, yo, Candace, don't forget your umbrella today. Um, and, uh, and, and maybe, you know, it's not just, it doesn't say that every time it rains, but maybe it could be a little bit smarter than that. And so what if you had these multiple holons, um, these agents that do very simple things. Like we have Cal, and all Cal does in this back channel, just dumps every time Candace has an upcoming meeting, just says, hey, Candace is a meeting with her brother for lunch in the mission today. And that's all he does, is just echo into this channel something that's gonna happen. And then you have another bot that picks that up and it's like, oh, someone's mentioned a place. Well, the temperature around uh, lunchtime is gonna be 64 degrees Fahrenheit. And then you have another bot that you know, looks at that and goes, oh, wait, uh, oh, it looks gonna rain. There's an 85% chance of rain in San Francisco today. Like they're all sort of doing very simple monadic things. Like maybe reacting to things that are written in the channel, but adding to it. And then you may have this bot on that we looked at before that then goes, oh, wait a minute. You know, uh, Candace has a meeting and it's gonna rain. I better tell her that she needs her umbrella. Um, and then so the bot says, yo, Candace, don't forget your umbrella. Thanks, Sam, um, you're the best. Um, and you could have this back channel where there could be a lot of things that are said and ignored. Um, but, you know, I, I look at this as like a ticker tape. You know, where you have, you know, if you look in the days of the ticker tape where, um, you know, you had information that was written to, the, the immutable information written to this ticker tape that people could observe. Um, and so what if humans could write to that ticker tape and bots could write to that ticker tape? ticker tape as well, and both could read and write to that tape as a channel. And it could be as noisy as you want it to be, or it needs to be. It doesn't mean that humans, need, that doesn't, that back channel could be uh, a completely uh, hidden channel. But it could also be one where uh, humans actually interact with some of these bots. Like we're, we're experimenting. So um, for the Beep Boop platform I mentioned, we don't have any administrative UI. What we're doing is we're building a lot of little bots to do things. Like for example, we have this one bot uh, that runs as a singleton. All it does is go through all the Slack tokens that people use and connect to and tries them periodically. And then when it find one, finds one that fails, it sends a message to a user, like in, through Slack, it drops a message. It's like, oh, this one's, you know, this token is expired. The user probably uninstalled your app. And then it goes and deletes the, uh, and another box, he picks it up and goes and deletes it from, um, 
you know, from kind of a record and like disposes of it properly. We have another one that goes and uh, all it does is look at events that happen and is measuring minutes of which things ran and is then dropping in these message uh, about like what's actually happening. So we're building all these little like autonomous agents and we're starting to interact with them in this sort of Slack back channel and starting to find ways that they could interact together like and experimenting in that way. And it's been like a really interesting experiment. Um, and so if you could like accept that this might actually occur, right? That you have these bots that can talk to bots and that can do like higher order things of complexity. Like you think like um is just reacting to all this data and information. It's been sort of you know, programmed to do pretty specific things about what happens. Uh, but ultimately what, what he does is very simple in this use case. It's just like remind me, you know, tell me uh, when there's an event at a particular time. He's constantly doing work until there's a time. And Candace doesn't you know, interact with um at all. He just, he just basically said one time and then it's just a notification. But if you can conceive that, then you know, perhaps you then um, you almost have this like synaptic network of, uh, of bots that can do higher and higher order things that are in some ways, uh, you know, uh, intelligence, right? And it's actually the way that, um, you know, we theorize how intelligence actually works in terms of, uh, you know, synaptic paths and neurons, et cetera. And the way that, right, that we, that we model um, a lot of the machine learning and deep learning uh, techniques are modeled. Um, and so uh, also in the mix, you know, with Arthur Kessler is like Marvin Minsky's Society of the Mind, which talks about intelligence and that like, there's no trick to it. That it really, intelligence really stems out of uh, this sort of vast diversity and not from any one single principle. So if you, um, you know, if you set out to build some bot experience that is like the all knowing single bot that knows everything about you, can do everything, and that is, like if you look even with Siri, um, and even Siri today, after years and years and years of a very large team just knocking off um, these skills, like your Alexa as well, like they just create like skills, like if someone asks about a movie, I can give you movie times. If they ask about the weather, I can give you the weather. And like, so these teams are building these systems uh, are just churning these things out. And there's a lot of it's like editorial content and matching on intents and things. But it's still like, of everything anybody asks from it, it's always like, you know, maybe once it's done, um, it's done and you could add, and maybe eventually they'll get to this place where you're like, this thing is really useful, but there's still always be all these other very unstructured things as well as all of those things are very, um, like, uh, you know, it's, it's a single exchange, right? I ask a question or say something, I get a response. I ask that the follow-up question, and there's no, there's no connectedness to any of these experiences. And that's where like, when we talk about context and managing, it was super, it's really, it's really hard, honestly. Like it's a very hard thing to do. And I think a lot of people are underestimating the ability to do this when, because you know, we as humans could, could have a conversation and we could change topics and come back to what we're talking to. And even if you say something, but don't have to re-explain the whole thing. And it was a conversation we had a week ago, you know, and we're like, hey, remember that? Yeah, I mean, it's like an unsaid thing to get a, you know, a computer to do this with us is extremely difficult, right? And I think a lot of people are, are underestimating it. So this is sort of my thought experiment, right? That you can create these whole hierarchies uh, of these sort of agents that are, are holons. Uh, and um, this, you know, uh, you could be, and the, interpret this multiple ways. You're like, you're effing crazy. Uh, you're stupid, uh, this will never work, or what if it did work? Uh, I think all those things are true. Uh, it's very brittle. Even the, um, like the first party, third party data implications of all this stuff, and like, wait a minute, I have all these bots that can, these little, like, can do all these things, there's all this data being exchanged, and like, so the way we're treating it, even the experiments that we're doing in building this product is like, it's all our data, it's all our bots, and it's all very first party. Like, and it's all, everybody's in the trust tree that's there. We're not like letting it go out. Um, but so there's a lot of those problems potentially to be solved, but like, I don't know, maybe, maybe there's something there. So uh, beware of the left pad bot, which is, um, I don't know if everybody, if anybody's familiar with like the Node.js community, what happened, there was like, um, so in Node.js there's this package manager called NPM, uh, and NPM, it's, it's been one of the, like, the, the foundations of why it's been a successful platform, is you've got just hundreds of thousands of 
packages that developers have published and with very, very deep dependency graphs, or like one depends on another, which depends on another, depends on another. Well, uh, Kick, ironically, the messaging platform, had a dispute because they, uh, there's a developer that had a module named uh, Kick, and Kick wanted to publish their, their developer uh, SDK and name it Kick, and they reached out to the developer, the developer basically was like, no. Uh, and then NPM, the organization that uh, uh, runs NPM stepped in and basically unpublished his module. And so this developer who had also published a bunch of other modules basically was like, I'm out, F it. And he, he, he unpublished everything he ever published to NPM. One of them was this really simple module that added left pad spacing or zeros to like a number. Like that's all it did. As it turns out, <laughs> like 70% of the modules on the, like in some indirect way depended on it. Like, so if you look at like some of these things of like what happens, and that happens on a, a lot of these platforms too, I hear, uh, like even on Telegram, where like these, uh, you know, these bots like come and go, like people write them and they go away and either users uh, uninstall them or users are attached to them and developers leave them. And it's like things that are much easier to create are also much easier to abandon, you know, like much invested interest. And I think there's a lot there, but uh, so this is like a tongue in cheek joke. But, um, but in general, I think like, yeah, and for a developer audience, which is where I gave the background, right? But you think of these bots, you're like, what could go wrong? Everything, right? Like in that model. But so what I'm basically trying to do is I feel like if you looked at even the way Steve Jobs describes um, the, the situation, like when what the iPhone launched into and how much better it was. And if you can, you know, put yourself in that position of like, we're in very early days. Um, and it... Maybe, I mean, who knows? What, was it inevitable that the iPhone or some equivalent would launch? Or if he didn't, if Apple didn't, would we have gone in a completely different direction, right? You know, it's an interesting thought experiment. Uh, and I think that bots are going to be boom or bust. Uh, I think no matter what, they're going to look very different than they do today. They have to. Because what we have today really is they're permanent building blocks that aren't particularly useful. I think they're going to really have to evolve. And so what I'm trying to do when I talk like this is just get people just to think differently about the whole thing. Um, and so, uh, and I think in general, um, I love this Isaac Newton quote, which is that, you know, we're all just standing on the shoulders of giants. Like the fact that I could create this tech spot within minutes and publish it and like you on this device that's detached and connected to the internet and right. So the reason we could do all these amazing things and innovation has really been accelerating year over year over year is because we're all just humbly standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, and so, um, I'll just wrap it up. Uh, so again, I didn't really talk much about Beep Boop, but we're a bot hosting platform. We're kind of invested in, um, I don't know, in the potential for conversational user interface and bots that are created with developers. The journey's only begun, so come join us if you're interested. Um, check it out. And uh, that's all I had. Thanks for a great talk. I um, wanted to understand if you draw a line between Siri, Cortana, Google Now, and bots, mm -hmm. or is that one of the same? I think they're one and the same. Um, I mean, there's, there's people that theorize that, uh, like Viv, did you hear about the launch of Viv? Which was, a, it was a team that built Siri. Um, and, and they're building um, basically the next, iteration over what they built uh, for Siri in a way where they claim to be doing like dynamic code generation of code paths to, and, and they're trying to build out this platform where developers can provide those skills and capabilities that they could tie together in a, uh, in a graph or kind of mesh and that they could sort of dynamically select and create a path for a user based on those things that exist in a, this huge knowledge map. Um, but they know that, and I think, um, you know, I mean, the reason that Apple and others create developer ecosystems is because they can't build it all themselves, right? And you see even, like, uh, you know, I think um, Tim Cook said there's over 2 million apps, like, launched in the, in the App Store, right? And it's like, you, you may only use 10, right? But there are 10 great ones or whatever. And so um, I think it'll be interesting to see 
if uh, all the bot interaction goes through some central media, and if it does, it's like you're looking at the next antitrust lawsuit that happens 10 years from now. Because how do you pick whether you, you send your hotel search request to hotel.com or Travelocity, or you make all these decisions about where to send users, uh, and there's gonna be a lot of bias there. But yeah, I think there, it's one big thing. I think it hasn't flushed out enough to even be able to categorize things. Some people are calling like these smaller, more simpler interactions like microbots. Um, yeah, I think it's more likely you'll see those types of like these little conversational interactions, interfaces all over the place and not necessarily everything through one sort of portal. Hello? Yeah. I'm thinking about the issue of the uncanny valley um, mm -hmm. and how in creating a robot that um, has sort of these human capabilities, um, people who interact with it get a sense of unease and uh, sometimes revulsion. And I was wondering in your, your vision of the, um, the, the whole archy, um, do you think it requires, for it to be a success, do you think it requires um, us as, hum as a human species to get used to the idea of interacting with bots like this and having it be near human but not actually human? Or is it predicated on the um, bots becoming better and better and essentially more intelligent? I think that both ends have to change. I think bots have to get better and better. Um, I think we have to figure out even from a perception perspective what users expect and they're comfortable with. And I think those comforts and expectations will change. Um, I heard an example today, it was actually Stuart Butterfield, gave this example today about uh, self-parking cars. You know, like cars now, they just park, parallel park themselves. And you know, he was like, I, I still don't trust them at all. Like I don't, I, I'm sure, and he's like, I'm sure they do, they do a better job than I do, but I still don't trust them. And I think, um, you know, people, there are other, like, and a lot of times it's younger generations that go like, oh, of course the car can park itself. And I think we'll have like, which is why like younger generations tend to drive some of the change because they know this preconceived notion. And I think like, will people's expectations will evolve and not necessarily evolve to be more accepting of things. They may actually become um, less accepting and, and more paranoid about even, uh, um, you know, if you, it's really, if you ever like write a bot, definitely look at the law, like look at what people say. It's like, fascinating. People are really rude. <laughs> like, um, and say really awful things. And, I, I went, and so I talked to a lot of people that, this weekend that shared, especially on the more consumer oriented uh, uh, messaging platforms, they were like 70% of the conversation is about sex. Like even that, um, the, um, uh, the smart child bot, they were like, 70% of people were like just trying to get the bot to say they would have sex with them. Which is really pathetic, you know? Like it's, but it's, tr it's true, you know? And I, I guess like, you know, I'm sure like the pornography industry is gonna thrive on this kind of thing. But like, um, but it also leads to a lot of like, if you knew that other people were looking at what you were saying to a bot, would you do it? When, as it turns out today, a lot of people do look at it. And then sometimes you, know, you have these like human in the loop situations where you, know, you have a bot, like for example, there's a talk today from someone from TED, and TED created a bot that is, provides like a white glove service at their conferences um, where it, it helps people kind of through these like this five day conference with speakers and stuff. And, uh, but it's just manned by humans. But the bot has like a very uh, cartoonish persona and I think people they don't know necessarily, like, they don't identify with it's a human. Like it's not like at a call center where you're like, hi, my name is Mark, how can I help you? It's just like this people behind it and everybody assumes that they don't know if it's a human or not. I think a lot of situations, uh, it'd be interesting if, how important is it for you to know, is it a human or not? And will those lines just eventually get blurred and eventually you don't really care, it's not important for you to know, I don't know. I think, but I guess to answer your question, I think that both has to change. Like bots need to get better uh, people will need to be more accepting, but I think it's going to create a lot of, there's already a lot of like trust and privacy issues now with the, the internet and apps at large and where your data is and where it's stored. And, but we're also seeing that people, 
even though they, they vocalize those concerns, they vote with their fingers and their hand, and they don't, the way they vote, they don't care. They like throw caution at the wind. Most, the majority of people. Um, so yeah, I guess we'll see, but I think both have to change. Back here. Hi, thanks. Well, uh, speaking of uh, maybe bots saying, people saying things they shouldn't or bots saying things they shouldn't, Microsoft had to stop their bot twice on Twitter because it yeah. basically turned into Hitler. Um, but uh, uh, earlier we heard about you know Flickr and monetizing the hashtag and things like this, and, and I'm wondering, it, it keyed this off in my mind when you said, how do I know uh, which hotel website it'll go mm -hmm. to? I mean, how will bots actually proliferate in a in a space that needs money to work? You know, you are you serving ads in mm -hmm. a bot response? Are they? you know, uh, getting a sort of path of least resistance to, to certain services and not others. And are, is that obscured in the sort of holarchy or, or whatever? And are, do you have bots kind of managing that as well? Like how, do you, how do we expect to deal with this and how do we expect realistically to, for money to flow through these bot networks? Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, in terms of like the holarchy, I don't know. Like that, definitely a thought experiment uh, in terms of like composition and sort of bots. And I think it even maybe more applies to like the, even the Slack or like work type use enterprise use case, um, the monetization is very very much yet to be determined. Uh, but I I, th I think that like bots aren't going to be the product that they're going to be part of some other service, and it's either going to be a value add. It may be the primary way that you interact with that, but you're not going to say I bought a bot to do. It's like I bought, you know, I don't. When I think of Uber, I think of the experience of like, the I get driven somewhere and it's so frictionless. I don't think about all the technology behind it, and I feel like bots are part of the solution. Um, there's a lot of talk now about uh, discoverability, um, and, and it's really up to the platforms to, to solve that. Like, how are you going to discover Facebook bots? How do they spread? How do you know what's good and what exists and what you can trust and not? And I think the platforms really need to, to try to solve that, because I don't, there's not going to be like a third-party bot store that you go, you're not going like to go to this directory and be like, what bots are there? I just don't see that happening. And so it'd be interesting to see where that evolves and if they're like where the conflicts of interests occur, even on platforms and what you want them to, you know, what they want you to do and how they want you to behave and how they want to monetize you versus um, how the, the people creating these bots and services with bots on these platforms want to, how they want to monetize their users and you know, the way that um, they're able to do that or restricted to do that. Hi, yeah, I'm a co-founder of a company that's doing consumer apps for Amazon Echo slash Alexa. And uh, first a comment, in terms of people, how they feel about talking to machines versus people, there is a chunk of research on that at this point. And for instance, I was just reading an article about in medical contexts, patients are much more likely to reveal more information about themselves to a machine than to a human. So, and even going yeah. back to the ELISA stuff, uh, mm -hmm. there was evidence for that. So um, in terms of my question, when I look at what people are doing with bots, and usually you know, they're talking about conversational UIs and it's text, are you drawing a distinction between the texting interfaces and voice user interfaces? Because to me, it seems like the text thing is just a kind of a, maybe a brief resting point on the way to the voice user interfaces except maybe in environments where people don't want to speak out loud or something like that. What do you think? Yeah. I think, um, let's see where to start. Yeah, I, your first point, I totally agree that, uh, and it even, um, like for example, with elementary school kids who are struggling to read, have you ever heard of those programs where um, you could read to a dog? Uh, like I know our kids went to the school and they had this program for kids who were struggling to read and had these like performance anxiety problems, but they would sit them down and they'd say, read to the dog, and they would connect with this animal and be able to read freely to the animal. I think like, there's kind of this opportunity to do that with technology as well. Um, now the, the voice and the, the text piece, I think is, um, a lot, I think it's, it's like conflated too much. Because I think they're different, they're sort of the same, like one the same, but very different. Like I think the interface is different, right, in terms of um, the capabilities and uh, and, and what really what you're able to do, like for example, um, sometimes you could very succinctly say something, um, but if you have this longer running conversation, it's hard to go back and reference like, versus like if you're in a text interface, 
and you're texting, you could stop and pause for as long as you want. You could go back and interact or reference something. But in voice, it's, it's very linear and free-flowing. Um, and even those cases with, it's, it's still very difficult today uh, to say, like, you know, it's like, Alexa, tell me the weather for uh, San, um, San Diego, right? And like, this, that, even, or like the, I uh, actually saw a talk today from, uh, I forget her name. But uh, she's one of the people at Microsoft Research who's working on Cortana. And talked about like the most common utterance like that is I I I. It's, it's like, I, I people start off like I I, I think I want to I, I need to know, uh, and they're getting better at those types of things. But um, you know, she said like like the linearity of that as well as the um, the situational, like you said, you know whether you're in private or not. Like I think I tried an experiment where I got an Alexa and put it in her office just to see kind of what would happen. Because I thought it'd be interesting, like I'm doing a lot of stuff with Slack, and I'd be like, it's kind of interesting having this physical thing in the office that could tie into the like, virtual work group thing. Uh, we even have a bot that runs on a Mac Mini. That, but it was really awkward, actually, in the office. And part of that is because like, it's tied to a person, like your Amazon account. And like I had all sorts of awkward things show up on my wish list. And everybody, everybody will troll everything. Um, but it's like Alexa works great in like a safe, like in your home. And it'd be great in the car. Like, I would love to have that type of interface in the car. And, um, but out in the public, right, it's, it's awkward. And even, like, how do you know it's your voice and the interference that happens? And I mean, I guess that's why it's part of the reason why there's these trigger words. Because if there weren't, you know, it would happen. Um, based upon your uh, um, experience and uh, um, asking to put your futurist hat on, um, and uh, the lack of any other um, examples I can think of. Do you do you um, think that the com uh, conversational interface will get to the point of advancement in which it's almost like um, the star, like the Star Trek Enterprise computer, or like maybe even Jarvis from Iron Man or something like that? I don't know. I, like I don't think I don't know if it'll ever be like if you've seen that movie Her. I don't think that's ever gonna happen. Like I I I don't think we'll ever get there. Um, I think we can get pretty advanced, especially like I think, you know, a lot of times we, we think about creating, like how do we displace what humans do with bots? How do we do that? How do we, you know, replace humans? But I think there's an opportunity for machines to do things that human can't, humans can't do. You know, like humans don't, or computers don't forget. Like they don't have to forget, right? Whereas humans forget. You know, these bots, these conversational interfaces could answer the same questions happily 100,000 times, but the human won't. You know, and so, and they could talk to, even in that movie, like, you know, it's mind-blowing to say, I'm talking to how many other hundreds of people all at the same time, not just you, it's not a personal experience. So I think, like, um, I don't know what it looks like. I feel like it's not going to, it's like the same thing of, like, if you project, I, I really think it's going to look a lot different. I think that, though we're way overestimating, like, what those interface, and a lot of it's driven by Hollywood and the Hollywood expectations about like how we'll, even with Jarvis, and how we'll be able to like, that this is going to be the most efficient way of dealing like, like you're in your own closed room, because a lot of times like we work, in, and we're going to probably work in more, more crowded places, and like, you know, we have this intimate experience with our computer, and not like, you're not going to like pull up in Starbucks and be like, okay, like, right? And I think we're going to find that by figuring out what works and the technology drive it. But I, like, I don't think, I, I think, there are a lot of limitations, uh, and we're making a lot of presumptions about. I, I love the optimism. I mean, I'm optimistic too. I think we'll probably create uh, some, some. I think amazing things will be created, but they'll be different than what we think. Hi. Sure. Hi. Um, my name is Z, and this is regarding Alexa. So we have the Amazon Echo Alexa at home, yeah. and this also adds to one of the questions that somebody asked before about humans: how comfortable are we with robots while we at home love to explore anything that comes in new and especially from technology side. So we got Alexa. Now the funny thing is uh, one night, like 2 a.m., Alexa started talking and the house was quiet and we know that Alexa talks or responds only when you say Alexa and you start a conversation. So the house was all quiet, but she was talking at 2 in the night and I was like, oh, whatever, must be a bug in the in the system and I just slept. But next day morning, I was a little bit concerned, whom was she talking to? <laughs> so I'm wondering, you know, how do we deal with those kind of scenarios with robots? 
Wow. Yeah, you should call in somebody to Ghostbusters. <laughs> you've got you've got some other special things in your house. But did you hear what happened at the uh, for the Super Bowl commercials? Like so, you know, Alexa in the Super Bowl, like the. They had the commercials where they're like, Alexa, was Alec Baldwin and stuff. And like everybody's Alexas that were in the background in the living room started to like answer and react to it. And I mean, think about the security and privacy concerns. Like I heard someone uh, said that they were working with a, uh, a light bulb manufacturer that's building all these APIs for controlling this light bulb. But the one thing they won't let you do is like control it via your voice because they don't want like your device to be attached to something like Alexa that there's some like it's it's really a big attack vector. Like if you can get some audible, th even if you just get loud enough, like someone's outside of your house, and broadcast like Alexa, open the front door, like super loud. How many decibels? Like and it opens the front, the garage door comes open or whatever. Um, or there's people that like I've seen these hacks where people will take uh, like a Mac and you can use like the say command on a Mac, you know, and, and get to speak. And so you have like the Alexa right next to this thing. And I've seen people do that on Slack. So you can type things in Slack. It'll say it on the, you know, through a bot on the Mac and then Alexa, it does things, but it's like a huge security vector to attack so vector. So this will be our last question, yeah. but I'm sure our speaker will be able to stay after a little bit more. And we're uh, gonna uh, let people do a little networking oh, afterwards the too. Yeah, there you go. So there will be opportunities for more, but uh, this will be the last formal question. Thanks for the great talk. I really awesome. enjoyed it. Uh, and my question is, um, a lot of the bot um, we're uh, mentioning today is more functional based. So it's either doing a calendar task or kind of calling a Uber. So I was wondering, would what, what's your thought on the kind of companion bots that could really communicate with people? Maybe like I wake up 3 a.m. and uh, I would like to chat with mm -hmm. some someone or some bot. Uh, so so how would would this sort of uh, longer dialogue um, uh, would, would this uh, happen, first of all, if you think, and then would this be uh, kind of the potential value of a bot? I, you know, I think that like, the opportunity in the consumer space specifically is huge in the entertainment area. Um, and people are already starting to see it. Like I know like a uh, Call of Duty game was released and they launched a bot and Messenger and stuff, and like you could actually talk to the characters in the game and interact. And I think even with with movies and entertainment and games, like that you don't just have this closed box game experience, but it can like permeate and with different reaches of your life and be personable. Um, like Microsoft, they launched that Taybot and, and <laughs> we saw what happened with that. Like I launched it on Twitter and uh, I guess the first six hours were amazing and then it went off the rails. But they launched uh, two other bots that were really similar and one, I forget the names of them. There's one in China and one in Japan. Okay. Yeah, what was this? Chow Ice. Chow Ice, yeah. Um, and they had, uh, I've seen all, like these really interesting chat dialogues with that uh, of like, and a lot of uh, like students, like college age students uh, in Japan use the Japanese one. Uh, one of the examples is just, they have these spikes uh, like late at night when like all your friends are sleeping and you can't text your friends and you text the bot and it's just like, oh, shall I, I, I don't feel like studying. You know, I'm really worried about this test. And like, she's like really encouraging like, don't worry about it. You're strong. You'll do fine. It's like, but I don't know, you know, and like, and so it's really interesting to see people like lean on this bot for emotional support, even though they know it's like this computer, but they find this attachment and they, and the things that they share are really intimate and they build like a connection with it. Like similar to the way that children, it's like imagination. They, they like look at it, how they could bond with like a stuffed animal. I'm like you certainly know that it's not real or the imaginary friends, like, well, like real actual relationships with like, these inanimate objects, whereas like these these bots or these like personas that actually have these personalities aren't inanimate in the same ways, but they aren't real either. I think, especially in the entertainment industry, I think it's going to be it's going to be it, it's the potential to be huge. Like the Old Spice guy, he should be. I'm surprised he's not a personality. Like if he was born today, like that guy in the in, in like the Super Bowl commercials and everything else would be this like personality that you could interact with on the internet. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.